Well, hello, Christ Chapel. Great to see all of you. Hello to all of you joining us at the Fort Worth campus, West campus, South campus. And if you're joining us uh, online, thanks so much for spending some of your time uh, to be able to worship with us. Hope you all enjoyed the rain yesterday. Thought I might have to build an ark. Man, it kept raining, praise God. Super, super thankful for it. Uh, but hope you got some rest yesterday and glad you came to worship today. I want to start off with uh, some axioms this morning. And the first axiom is every rose has its thorn. You know that. Poison taught us that. But another axiom is this, that every scar has a story. Every scar has a story. And you know that to be true, maybe because uh, you have a scar and therefore you have a story or you have a friend or a family member that has a scar. And I have uh, uh, buddies that have uh, great scars, great stories, stories of uh, courage, of adventure, of glory days gone by. But that all those scars uh, have story. And I've realized that, that people are apt to share those. They're ready to share uh, those stories, especially if those uh, scars are very very obvious or noticeable or in, in plain sight. But I also think they're ready to share those stories about scars because there's an implication to every scar. And that is a hurt has been healed. I mean, it wouldn't be a scar if there wasn't a hurt originally that had been healed. And it's easy to talk about hurts that have been healed. It's easy to talk about things that have happened in the past, but they've turned out okay. It's easy to share those stories about those scars. But what if you have hurts that are hidden that haven't healed yet? What if you have those hurts that are, are underneath that haven't experienced that healing to where they are now healed scars? You see, those are called wounds, if they haven't healed, they're called wounds, those hurts that uh, have been uh, uh, unhealed yet. And if you have those, those wounds, the problem with leaving those wounds uh, unattended and not giving uh, attention to them is that those wounds end up infecting other parts of your body, other parts of your identity. You see, the longer that you let those wounds go unhealed, the longer they fester, the more they affect your identity, the more that they affect your everyday life. And let me tell you an axiom that is not true. Time does not heal all wounds. Only Jesus can. And that's who we need to go to uh, today. Because if there's anything that I want you to learn from this entire series, Please hear this because we're going to pound this into your head and heart over the next few weeks is you are not defined by your struggles, you're defined by your Savior. You are not defined by your struggles, you're defined by your Savior and we're not going to be defined by our hurts. We're going to be defined by the hope and healing that comes from Jesus. And I want to show you that from the scriptures today. So if you will, open your Bibles to John chapter 11. John chapter 11, uh, it's page 897. If you're opening one of those blue Bibles, no matter what venue you're in, we're obviously continuing our series, uh, I Think, I Feel, I Am. And this is going to take us almost through the entire month of May, just so that you know. Uh, we'll finish the week after Mother's Day, I believe. And so just so you know about how long uh, this series is. So we're obviously continuing that series. The first week was uh, I Think, I Feel, I Am Anxious. And then Last week was, I, I think I feel I am afraid. We talked about, about fear. And uh, Ben talked about, we, he talked about the passage where uh, the disciples are in the boat with Jesus and they're afraid that, that they're going to die. And the way that he talked about that storm, I want to pick up on. Because he talked about that storm as it, as it built on that emotion of anxiety. That if anxiety is the, what if the storm comes? You see it in the distance. What if the storm comes? But fear, or I am afraid comes when the storm is swirling around you. The storm is here and you're afraid that this is it. Well, today what we're going to talk about is I think I feel I am hurt. And th where this is in that progression is the storm has passed through and you are left hurt. 
You are living in the aftermath of the storm. What you might have been anxious would happen. What you might have been afraid would happen as the storm swirled around you actually happened. And now the storm has gone through and you are the walking wounded left to pick up those pieces. Because every story doesn't end up like the one that we studied last week where the disciples in the boat, although they're afraid, make it to the other side unscathed. Sometimes we are hurt. Sometimes that storm blows through our life and it hits our hearts. It it, it hurts our our minds. It hurts us in so many uh, different ways. And I want to talk about some of those different kinds of hurts as we study this John chapter 11. Now, uh, I know that hurt comes in in many different forms. I've I've broken it down into kind of three different categories. Uh, Intentional hurt unintentional hurt and inevitable hurt. So intentional hurt, that is abuse. That is anger. That is a jealousy. Uh, that, that is stuff where people uh, lash out. That honestly, sometimes if it's intentional hurt, sometimes it's just plain evil. It's just evil. And if you've experienced that, I'm, I'm so sorry. That is, that is intentional hurt or unintentional hurt. That, that are, that's things like tragedy or, or accidents or natural disasters or those, those things that just uh, occur un, unintentionally. No one meant to hurt you, but, but you were hurt by something that happened. And then there's the inevitable kind of hurt, and that is disease. That is death. We live in a broken world world where hurt happens to us because of the sin and brokenness uh, in our world uh, today. And no matter how you've been hurt, no matter what category you might say that has affected uh, you, I want you to hear, I'm sorry, and my heart is with you. But more importantly, what I want you to hear today is God's heart is with you. God cares. And I want to show you that, that just because you're hurt doesn't mean that God doesn't care. And we've, we're going to study a passage that is filled with very raw emotion, raw hurt. It has, it, it has happened and it has happened immediately. People haven't had time to, to process this or time to heal. And Jesus is going to step in. So what I want to show you from John chapter 11 are those different kinds of hurts, ways that I think all of us can relate to being hurt in our lives, hurt in our world. But then I want to show you how Jesus intervenes and I want to show you how we can flip the script so that we're no longer defined by our struggles, we're defined by our Savior. We're not defined by our hurt, we're defined by the healing and hope that Jesus brings into our lives. So, John chapter 11, I want to kind of set the context for you, please. And uh, you will need a copy of your sermon notes and the scripture open. And by the way, before we jump in here, I'm just going to let you know, I know that when we fill in the last fill in the blank, all of you shut your notes and your Bibles, and you're like, we're done. We're not done today, okay? There's stuff that we're going to pick up on even after we fill out that last fill in the blank, okay? So please keep your Bibles open because there's stuff that's not going to come up uh, on the screen that I want you to see in the scriptures for yourself. Okay, we're jumping in. John chapter 11, verses 1 to 3. Let's set the context here. It says, now a certain man was ill. That's Lazarus of Bethany the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, him being Jesus, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. So let me set the context for you here. You have, actually, and you'll, you'll find out later explicitly, there are three siblings, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. And these three siblings are in Bethany, which I'll show you in just a second. But Lazarus falls ill. He falls ill. This is the sibling that, that we're told of Mary. And there's an interesting line in there that that we just read that's a descriptor of who Mary is. If you look back at it, Mary is the one who anointed Jesus with oil. Now, do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing? It's a good thing. 
It's a very, very good thing. A thing that she did publicly. A thing which proclaimed her love for Jesus. Let me say this. If there's anybody that deserved an I don't get hurt in life card, it's Mary. And her brother falls ill. And this is an illness that isn't like the sniffles or a stomach bug. This is severe stuff. And I think we can all relate to that because we feel hurt when God lets something bad happen. We all feel hurt when God lets something bad happen. We are rational beings and being rational beings, we understand a cause and effect. And if there's something that Uh, somebody does that is bad, we expect that obviously bad things will happen. Bad things happen to people who do bad things. Logically, that makes sense. That cause and effect. But what we don't understand rationally and logically is that bad things not only happen to bad people, but bad things happen to good people and bad things happen to godly people. And you go, why is that? I I don't understand. Why does God let bad things happen to good people and even godly people? People who come to church, people who tithe, people who volunteer in kids ministry, people who serve at soup kitchens. Why does he do that? I don't know. I'm just being honest with you. I don't know beyond we live in a broken and sinful world where bad things uh, do happen. And we've got to acknowledge that, that that is true. That doesn't mean that God can't intervene, and I'll show you that in a second. But bad things don't just happen to bad people. And we've got to take away that cause and effect in our life. And the other way that we've got to take away that cause and effect is this. That just because you do godly things means you won't get hurt. If you are worshiping Jesus as an insurance policy so nothing bad happens to you, that's not worship. That's not true, genuine. Worship is a response to God revealing himself to us, the one true God. That's that, that response and, and if we're just coming to say, God, I've, I've put in my time, I've paid my time, therefore, don't let anything bad happen, then he's not God, he's Geico. You, 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 that, 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 and that's not who he is. We, we can't uh, treat him like that. But it does hurt. I want to acknowledge that. You, you've probably been, been hurt and you might ask this question, why, do God let, why does God let bad things happen? happen or you feel hurt not just because God let something bad happen but you feel hurt because God doesn't show up like you hoped he would you feel hurt because God doesn't show up like you hoped he would these uh, sisters realize that that Lazarus is is very very ill uh, so much so that they they don't call just the the local doctor they call the great physician and Jesus isn't uh, exactly close. And I want to show you where Jesus is. Um, so you see Jerusalem. Jerusalem and Bethany, they're just two miles apart. It's just kind of over the hill uh, in Jerusalem where Bethany is. Um, you can see uh, the, the shaded region, the red shaded region there in Perea. That is the region where Jesus would have been. We find out in John chapter 10 that Jesus was in the region where John was baptizing his disciples. So we don't know exactly where he was, but you can tell he wasn't next door. He, he was on the other side of the Jordan River there in Perea. And so they realized something is wrong. And so uh, they uh, call for Jesus. Verse 6. So when uh, he heard, though, Jesus gets word that Lazarus is ill. Listen to this. When he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Okay, if the knife wasn't already deep enough, does it not feel like the knife is twisted? Like, come on, Jesus. You heard. 
You heard that he was ill, and now you decide to stay two days longer? I don't get it. I would expect that you would come running. I mean, that's what we sing worship songs about that, that he comes running. And that, that's our hope. That's our cry. That is our prayer. And I think that's how I can relate to this, this passage, that when they send word to Jesus asking him to respond, that's like what we do oftentimes when we pray. Uh, that's us sending word to God. God, I need your help. And when we send that word, when we pray, we expect God to show up in a particular way. But I want to be careful here. We've got to differentiate between expectation and petition. And what I mean by that is when we pray, we are petitioning God. God, would you please show up in this way? God, I need your help. Would you supply your power, your provision, your comfort, your healing? Would you do that, please, uh, in my life or in somebody else's life around me? That's a, that's a petition. That is a request that we are making of God. And the reason why we make that request of God is because we believe God can. We believe God hears us. And I believe God does answer those prayers. But we don't want, to, want him to answer two days later. I don't want him to wait two days. I want him to do it now. He can do it now. Why doesn't he just do it now? That, that's, what, that's what we want. That's, what we, that's not only what we hope for. That's not only what we ask for. That's what we expect. And when God doesn't meet our expectations... Sometimes we can begin to project on God what our experience begins to, to uh, frame up for us. And here's the dangerous part. If he doesn't meet your expectations, don't run to the fact and say that Jesus isn't powerful enough. That's why he didn't come. Jesus is, is afraid to step in because he doesn't have the power. Or Jesus doesn't care. That's not true. That's not true at all. He does care deeply, but I understand it hurts. It hurts not, not only when God lets bad things happen, but when he doesn't show up like we hope, expect, or even ask him to. That hurts. That cuts deep. And we hurt when he doesn't show up, and we also feel hurt when God doesn't seem to understand the depth of our pain. We feel hurt when God doesn't seem to understand the depth of our pain. The sisters send word to Jesus. He stays two days longer in that region uh, that I showed you. But he does come to Bethany. He does come to the side of the sisters, uh, Mary and Martha. And, but by the time that he gets there, uh, Lazarus has been in the tomb for four days. He's been in the tomb for four. So he's been dead for four at least four days. He's, he's stuck inside there. And Jesus shows up, and we learn from verse 19 that Mary and Martha are certainly upset as any sister would be if that has happened to their brother, if Jesus didn't show up in time like they had asked him to or expected to. And here's what it says in verse 21. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. If you had been here, then he wouldn't have died. I thought I told you, Jesus, how severe the situation was. I, I thought word got to you that this wasn't a stomach bug. This wasn't the sniffles. This was bad. And we needed you to show up. And it seems like we understood how severe this was. And honestly, it under, it, we think that everybody else understands. Because you find out in the context that everyone in Jerusalem who knew Mary and Martha had come to Bethany and they were grieving as well. You've got the whole city. Everybody knew how, how severe this was, how tragic this was. Everybody knew the severity of the, the situation. Everybody understood the depth of our pain, but God, you didn't understand. Jesus, you didn't understand. If you had understood, then you would have shown up, and he wouldn't have died. That, that, that hurts. 
And I think all of you can experience this uh, on many different levels where you've experienced this, where he's let something bad happen. He hasn't showed up like you've expected. And you feel like he doesn't understand the depth of your pain. But he does. But he does. And I want to go back and I want to show you a verse that is very enlightening to this entire passage. Go back to verse 4. If you go back to verse 4, if you remember, we read 1 to 3 when they send word to Jesus. They say to him, Lazarus, the one whom you love is ill. Verse 4 says this, but when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It's for the glory of God so that the Son of God might be glorified through it. Jesus is, he is not letting on to how much he knows. He knows that death is not the end of the story. And I think that's really crucial for us to understand in our own lives, especially when we are experiencing hurt, is is this, that you're not the only character in the story. And I want to say that in love and compassion because that's exactly, you feel like you're the only one experiencing that. You might feel like that you are hurting more deeply than anybody else is hurting, but your story is not your story alone. Your story is also his story. And those stories are running parallel. And you're not, it's not only your story and his story as well. You're not the main character in your story. God is at work making himself the main character in that story. So that hurt is not the end of your story. Hurt isn't the punchline of your story. And hurt is not what defines your story. He is coming alongside you and knows something that you don't necessarily know. And in our finite minds, in our emotional hearts, that's hard for us to grasp and understand. I totally get that. But hurt is not the end of your story. It's not. Jesus knows and has a plan for you. Just like he had a plan for Lazarus. Before Lazarus died, he had a plan for him. Before the worst that we could ever imagine happening, Jesus had a plan for Lazarus, and he has a plan for you. And so when you are feeling hurt, when I think I feel I am hurt, we have to flip the script. We have to flip the script. And we can't let our our hurt define what we are experiencing, although that hurt is real. But I want to flip the script and I want to I ground us in the truth, not only of who God is, but the heart of Jesus and how he can interact in your life. And I want to show you that from the way that he interacts in Lazarus' life, Mary and Martha. So let's flip the script. When I think I feel I am hurt, I have to rest on the fact that I am loved by God. I am loved by God. And let, please hear me say this. Those of you, especially if you are hurting now, I'm so sorry. I, I really am. I wish I could take it away. Wish I could make it better, 100%. And if I tell you and you're hurting right now that you are loved by God, you say that sounds like a platitude. Like, like that's, that's meaningless. But it's not. That's the enemy telling you that. That's not true. God loves you. You are loved by God. And what I, what I love about this passage is that it shows us that. If you look back at verse 5, it says, Now Jesus loved Mar- Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Now everybody affected in this story, who are the three affected in this story? Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Who does Jesus love? Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. My point in saying that is nobody is left out of Jesus' love. Nobody. It's not, well, you know what? I would have shown up if I loved you, Lazarus, but I only love Mary and Martha. 
Because oftentimes that's what we think is, God, why do you love them? Why did you show up for them? Why did you heal them? Why didn't you heal me? Don't you love me? It looks like you only love them. And we begin to place those expectations on Jesus that if you love me, then you will. If you love me, then you'll show up in my marriage like you showed up in their marriage. If you love me, you'll show up in my hospital room like you showed up in their hospital room. If you love me, you'll show up in my relationship with my kid like theirs. And just because he doesn't show up when you hope he will, like you hope he will, doesn't mean that he doesn't love you. And this wasn't a a secret love that Jesus had for Mary and Martha and Lazarus, meaning he made it known. If if you look back at verse three, how do they describe, how do Mary and Martha describe their brother Lazarus? Look back at verse three. The one whom you love. Jesus had made it obvious to those sisters that he loved Lazarus. Obviously, he made his love for Mary obvious because she's anointing him with oil. He he made his love clear. He made it obvious. It wasn't secret. It could be seen. And you say, hold on, Cody. He hasn't made his love obvious to me. Hold on. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 said that God demonstrated his love for you in this. That while you were a sinner, Christ died for you. He has demonstrated his love for you. He has. And sometimes we want to say, though, but God, if you love me, though, you'll show up in this way. There is no greater love than him sending his one and only son to pay the penalty for your sin. That you, You and I didn't deserve that kind of love, but God didn't make it secret. He didn't, he didn't just sit idly by and say, well, I, I love you. Just, just trust it. Just believe it. You won't feel it. You won't see it. But just take it by faith. No. He said, I'll show you. You can feel it. You can understand. You can grasp it when he sent his son. You are loved by God. And I'm sorry if that's hard to feel right now. I'm really so I want you to feel it. I want you to know it. I want you to experience it. I want you to grasp it. I want you to bathe in it. But it's true. You see, feelings don't always define truth. And just because you don't feel love doesn't mean you aren't loved. God loves you. Second, I am loved by God, and what I feel is I I feel understood by God who weeps for me. We're descending here into depth, and, and and it's hard. I know it's hard. But this is a depth of spiritual reality here. When we get to understanding and grasping that we are loved by God, then we understand that he hurts like we hurt. If you look back at verses 33 and 35... When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her, they were also weeping. He was deeply moved and in his spirit, he was greatly troubled and he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And we get the shortest verse of all the Bible that says what? Jesus wept. I love that that's just one verse. Like if there's... If there's a verse that uh, you grasp onto, if you're never feeling loved by God, that's an easy one to memorize. Jesus wept. He, and it it wasn't like, you know, teary-eyed, you know, like, no, he like, he, I I love this. He paused and wept. He didn't have to. He didn't have to. He, he could have stepped in and he, did, he didn't have to weep. He didn't have to show any emotion. He, he could have acted immediately and instead he decided to stop, 
pause and weep. Let me tell you, if you are, if you are hurting, it is okay to grieve. I am not, and please, I, I really hope I haven't done that to you in this sermon. I am not trying to rush you into the healing process. I'm not trying to say, hurry up and get over it. Hurry up and heal. That's not what I, I want to communicate at all. I just want you to start healing. But sometimes in that process of just starting to heal, sometimes starting to heal starts with just grieving the hurt. That's where Jesus started. He just shows up and he weeps and he grieves. And I think he's weeping, one, because he hurts for Mary and Martha. Like this, this has been a hard deal for them. But I also think that he is weeping because he hurts as he sees the effect of sin. Like this is one that he loved who falls Ill, Ill and dies. But he doesn't just weep. He doesn't just hurt. He doesn't just grieve. I loved how it says that he was troubled in his spirit. He was moved. He was moved. And that, that moved literally means to, to move inside. But it also implies that he's moved to action. That, that he, yes, he is grieved. It moves him to tears, but he's all, also moved to action. And here's what that helps us all think. When we know that we are defined by his love for us and not our hurts, and when we feel understood that God weeps for us, then we think that restoration is possible for the glory of God. Restoration is possible for the glory of God. Jesus says, where have you laid him? And he begins to move toward the tomb. Remember, Lazarus has been in the tomb for four days. Martha doesn't want him to go anywhere near the tomb because she knows that decay has started to set in. But Jesus moves to the tomb. He moves toward the one who is hurting immediately. And here's what it says in verses 41 to 44. So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people that are watching and standing around, that they might believe that you sent me. Just pause real fast. Did Mary, Martha, and Lazarus know that Jesus was the Messiah? God is using this in their life as a testimony to those around them. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the man who had died came out. His hands and his feet, they were bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Love that. Absolutely love that unbind him, and let him go. He's not held by his hurts any longer. I am restoring him back to life. You see, when we understand how Jesus can intervene, we understand that restoration is possible. And I want you to understand that restoration is possible for you. And I don't know exactly what that means. I, I really don't. I, I don't know if that means the restoration of a relationship, if that means restoration health-wise. I will admit, there is some restoration that will only come that side of heaven, where there, where there is no, no hurt, where there is no disease, where there are no tears. That is what he promised us, because that's what he created for us in the very beginning. That's exactly what he intended for us, and that's what he's taking us too. But I also know that right now, he can step in and begin to heal hurts and restore us for the glory of God. It doesn't matter the depth of the hurt or the duration of the pain. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't matter. Jesus comes to this tomb that four days, Martha goes, he's long gone. And Jesus says, not with me. 
I don't know, I don't know if you got hurt a long time ago. Maybe, maybe the way that you hurt was completely evil. God can still intervene and use it for your good and his glory. I know it. Scripturally, we know that's true. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. God can work all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. When he says in scripture, all things, do you think that includes hurt? And I know some of you, it's going to take a while to say yes, but yes. All things includes your hurt. He can use all things for your good and for his glory. And that's what he does here in Lazarus' life. He steps in to his life and uses that situation to show everyone around him that he is the Messiah, that he doesn't just have the power to protect the ones he loves from ever getting hurt. He has the power to step into the lives of the one he loves in the midst of their hurt and restore them so that they walk freely again in him. See, don't miss that. He says, unbind him and let him him go. You see, Lazarus doesn't walk around carrying around the bandages going, yep, I was hurt. He walks around freely, leaving the bandages behind. He's not defined as being a victim. He's defined by being a victor. That is the life that Jesus sets free. And that's how he wants to define you. That you have, you are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus, as we learn in Romans chapter 8. That he can step in and heal those things so that you walk freely. That you don't have to carry around those bandages as a name tag or, or as, as a, a wound that you go, yeah, I'm hurt, I'm hurt, I'm hurt. I'm sorry you've been hurt. But he wants to use that hurt to step in and restore you for the sake of his glory. And I know that because that's exactly what happened in Lazarus's life. Let me fast forward in the story. And this is why I wanted you to leave your Bibles open. Please, thank you for those of you who did. Um, look at John chapter 12, verse 11. John chapter 12, verse 11. If you look at it, it says this, that the Jews were trying to kill Lazarus. Why? Because on account of Lazarus, many Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. Lazarus goes, man, I've got scars, but my scars have a story. Let me tell you my story. My story points to a savior who raised me from the dead. And I'm not defined that I, I I'm, you know, was the one in the tomb. I'm not defined by that illness. I'm defined by one who now walks freely in Christ. So let me tell you about him. You see, Lazarus wasn't building a following for him. He was building a following for Jesus, pointing people back to him. I'm sure you've got hurts. We all have hurts. And if you don't have them now, they're probably coming. But Jesus can step into those hurts so that they don't become wounds because by his wounds, we are healed. His, his wounds were healed so that he begins to heal us and our hurts turn into scars. And we tell those stories that our scars bear, stories about Jesus and his great power in our lives because we're defined not by our struggles, we're defined by our Savior. Let me pray for us. God, we thank you that you can do the impossible. That even when we might feel ourselves like we are long gone, that we've been hurt too deeply, we've been hurt too long, you say, no, today, today's the day where I want you to understand I feel that hurt, I feel that pain, I love you, and I wanna step in and I wanna restore you and I wanna give you a story to tell that is about my goodness and about my love. Lord God, I know there are people listening that have covered up those hurts for far, far too long. Would you give them the courage and the faith to open up to you and say, Jesus, please, Come heal this hurt. Make it a scar that tells a story 
about your healing and your redemption in my life. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.